Well, everybody, a very hearty and warm welcome, especially to our uh, family from uh, the United States. And we're really looking forward to hearing uh, the Lord's servant bring us God's word this evening. And I do trust that all the technology goes as we uh, have intended. Let's take just a moment to prepare our hearts to meet with the living and true God. This is our joy. This is our privilege. Uh, let us quieten our hearts before him. But now, this is what the Lord says. He who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. Well, with those beautiful promises. Uh, from the Old Covenant, yea, and amen to us in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us take up our hymn books or our smartphones. We're going to sing hymn number 79. Hallelujah. Praise Jehovah. O oh my soul, Jehovah praise. Father, we remember how our Saviour on his way to Jerusalem was extolled and praised and people laid palm branches and their coats 
down in the path in front of the foal on which he was seated. And in Jerusalem the children proclaimed his goodness and greatness, and the joy, the privilege of extolling you. This is a great miracle you have wrought in us and in all the church of Jesus Christ through all the ages. For, O oh Father, we are not worthy like the angels to extol you and exalt you. We are not worthy to take your name upon our lips, except you have dealt with us in mercy and mercy and mercy and grace. You have united us to your Son, our Saviour, who says in that beautiful 22nd Psalm, in the midst of your people, in the congregation of the saints, I will extol you. And we follow his example and we joyfully join with him and all the people of God and the angels in heavenly assembly. We confess you are a great, mighty King and God. And we belong to you by your sheer mercy and grace. And you belong to us by your covenant promise. And here we are and we sing your praises. And we are the happiest people in all the earth. Thank you particularly for your grace and mercy to us and the providences of these past nearly 10 weeks now. And we thank you, Lord, that we look forward to worshipping you as a congregation of your people next week. Uh, face or to face, as it were, but just the warmth of the fellowship and of the contact. What a grace that is. And we ask, Lord, that you will draw from us even fuller praise, for we know that it is in our Saviour that you bless us with every good and spiritual gift. You have been good to us, Lord. And we are confess we are glad, glad, glad to be your people. So please help us this evening to extol you and to sing your beautiful praises. Have mercy upon us. O oh, Father, richly bless us, we ask. For we ask these mercies in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, if you missed this morning's announcements about our meeting next week, of course you may catch them on the YouTube video. The links have been sent out. But also, I trust that in the week we will send more information uh, for your uh, instruction. But we will meet particularly on Wednesday. Uh, and that will be our first opportunity to... Uh, honor the Lord and submission to the authorities and to be properly socially distanced and spaced out. But we look forward to that Bible study very much. And may I urge and encourage you, if you are free on Wednesday, uh, come and uh, enjoy a time of considering the one true living God, the Lord our God. We are studying Packer's book, Knowing God. Will you now please take up your Bibles and we are going to read God's word. And we're considering Exodus chapter 37, the details of the furnishings of the ark of God's presence in the middle of his people, the preparation for this tabernacle to be at the center of the life and the worship of Israel as they proceed from Mount Sinai all the way to the land of God's promise. Exodus chapter 37. Bezalel made the ark of acacia wood, two and a half cubits long, a cubit and a half wide, and a cubit and a half high. He overlaid it with pure gold, both inside and out, and made a gold molding around it. He cast four gold rings for it, and fastened them to its four feet with the two rings on the one side and the two rings on the other. Then he made poles of acacia wood and overlaid them with gold. He inserted the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark to carry it. He made the atonement cover of pure gold, two and a half cubits long and a cubit and a half wide. Then he made two cherubim out of hammered gold at the ends of the cover. He made one cherub on the one end and the second cherub on the other. At the two ends he made them of one piece with the cover. The cherubim had their wings spread upwards 
overshadowing the cover with them. The cherubim faced each other, looking towards the cover. They made the table of acacia wood, two cubits long, a cubit wide, and a cubit and a half high. They overlaid it with pure gold, sorry, with they overlaid it with pure gold molding around it. They also made around it a rim, a handbreadth wide, and put a gold molding on the rim. They cast four gold rings for the table and fastened them to the four corners where the four legs were. The rings were put close to the rim to hold the poles used in carrying the table. The poles for carrying the table were made of acacia wood and were overlaid with gold. They were made from pure gold. The articles for the table, its plates and dishes, its bowls and its pitchers for the pouring out of drink offerings. They made the lampstand of pure gold, hammered it out, base and shaft. Its flower-like cups, buds and blossoms were of one piece with it. Six branches extended from the sides of the lampstand. Three on the one side and three on the other. Three cups, shaped like almond flowers with buds and blos blossoms, were on one branch. Three on the next branch. And the same for all six branches extending from the lampstand. And on the lampstands were four cups, shaped like almond flowers with buds and blossoms. One bud was under the first pair of branches extending from the lampstand. A second bud under the second pair, and a third bud under the third pair. Six branches in all. The buds and the branches were all of one piece with the lampstand, hammered out of pure gold. They made its seven lamps, as well as its wick trimmers and trays, of pure gold. They made the lampstands and all of its accessories from one talent of pure gold. They made the altar of incense out of acacia wood. It was square, a cubit long and a cubit wide and two cubits high. Its horns were of one piece with it. They overlaid the tops and all the sides and the horns with pure gold and made a gold molding around it. They made two gold rings below the molding, two on opposite sides to hold the poles used to carry it. They made the poles of acacia wood and overlaid them with gold. They also made the sacred anointing oil and the pure fragrant incense, the work of a perfumer. Let us respond to God's word with praise for our Saviour. Hymn 33. Look, you saints, the sight is glorious. See the man of sorrows now. Crown him, crown him, crown 
crown him, crown him, spread abroad the victor's fame. Hark the bursts of acclamation, hark those loud triumphant chords. Jesus takes the highest station, oh what joy the sight affords. Crown him, crown him, crown him, crown him, King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen. Well, let us gladly bring our requests to the Lord's throne, the throne of grace. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you again that you are our God and we are your people. And you are our God and Father for the sake of our Saviour, your eternal Son, in whom we've been adopted into your family. Thank you that you provide for us every day. And we ask that you will continue to do so in your mercy and in your grace. We pray for our families that you will bless us and sustain us and keep us looking to you and instructing our children and learning of you and encouraging one another to love and good deeds. And we think of those children who will be resuming their schooling, perhaps tomorrow, perhaps in the short term, that you will be with our children and help them, Lord, to honour you uh, in the schools in which they are placed to own the Lordship of the Lord Jesus Christ and to serve you well and help us, O oh Lord, as... Uh, as parents to instruct our children in the fear of the Lord, to do them real and eternal good. Oh, Heavenly Father, we also pray for our government and thank you again for your mercy to them. And we ask, Lord, that despite the humanistic constitution, which is blasphemous in the end, that they will yet do what is good and right for the people of this country. And we pray that we will be kept in the freedoms that we enjoy, so that we, your churches, may worship and honour you. We thank you for answering our prayers in particular, and we look forward to Wednesday's Bible study, and we pray that on that occasion and in the weeks to come, we will just know your very special presence with us. We thank you. We may also pray for those in authority in the church. We ask for uh, Roger and Lunga and Garth and me, Lord, please make us true shepherds of your sheep. Please keep us from pride, the great pastoral pitfall and laziness close on its heels. Keep us from being self-indulgent and keep us especially from the temptation to want to establish our own kingdoms and our own names. How very much uh, we are sick prone to succumb to all kinds of temptations. Lord, keep us safe, we pray. And please continue to keep and watch over Patrick and the ministry, the very special ministry you've given to him. And we pray, Lord, that as a congregation of your people, we will not look to the men you've given us, but only to you. And we pray that through these men, we will all be taught of God. Have mercy upon us. Sustain us and feed us and keep us, we pray. And we pray, Lord, for the lamentable state of the church in our country and on the world abro abroad. We ask, Lord, that you will, in your wrath, remember mercy. Remember in the days of Jeremiah, in the late 7th and early 6th centuries before our Saviour came into the world, how, O oh Lord, you just gave those people over to all that they wanted. And you said to your servant Jeremiah, do not pray for this people. And then later you said to him, even if Moses and Elijah were here before me, I would not listen. Those who must go to the sword must go to the sword, and those to the famine to the famine, and those to captivity to captivity, and those to death to death. Lord, we feel very much that we live in almost identical days. But we sense Ah, the urgent need to pray, and we thank you for that. And we pray for the church, this 
fullness of Christ who fills everything in every way, that you will yet make us to be what we are by your grace. And so we are bold to ask, judge and expel the wicked from the churches and raise up the righteous. and Bring repentance in the midst of judgment, we pray, and may your name be honored. And may we see in, with our own ears and own eyes and hear with our own ears the glory of the Lord, as it were, covering the earth as the waters cover the sea. Please, please have mercy. We ask now, Lord, that you will bless us in the hearing of your word. We pray particularly that the distressed and the, the needy and the lonely will find soul nourishment and satisfaction in your word. But Lord, we pray that we all may find uh, all that you have for us through your servant. We pray you'll strengthen him. We pray again that you'll help us with the technology. And we pray, Lord, soon uh, uh, the Randalls will be back and enjoying uh, immediate fellowship with us and we enjoying our brother's ministry but we ask now that you will be with him and with us all may we all be under your life-giving word work in us by your spirit so that the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts may be pleasing in your sight in jesus precious name we ask amen well let's uh Turn, turn on our hymn books to hymn number 108, and I can't think of a more appropriate uh, hymn to sing in these times. When peace like a river attendeth my way, it is well with my soul. Hymn number 108.
brethren. Uh, just before I start, can can everyone hear me? Oh, oh, there we go. We can see you now. Good. Uh, perhaps you could tell me if you can yes, hear me. Yes, brother. Thank you. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you. Oh, well, brethren, good to be with you uh, virtually. Uh, as we said earlier and have said several times, we do long to be with you. And uh, we send our hearty greetings from the United States, which uh, I don't know if you've heard on the news has been having riots, the likes of which, and I'm very much open to correction on this, I I don't know that, uh, that South Africa, at least in the, the 10 year plus that I've been there, I don't recall hearing anything like uh, like what was happening in Minneapolis. Uh, in case you hadn't heard, even one of the police precincts got, uh, got burned down in the riots. Um, but yes, uh, we do pray, uh, continue to pray for the work in, in South Africa and long uh, to be back uh, with all of you. Well, please uh, turn with me uh, for the scripture reading to, uh, to Matthew chapter 16. I'll begin reading in verse 13. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Well, what about you, he asked. Who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but, my, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he warned his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Christ. Let's pray. Oh, our gracious heavenly Father, thank you for being our God. Uh, we thank you, as, uh, as Jim prayed earlier, that you do Indeed, in judgment, remember mercy. And, uh, we thank you for your ongoing uh, goodness um, to your people for sustaining us and for the wonderful encouragement we have that our blessed Lord and Savior continues to build his church. Uh, please be with us now as we consider this passage. Please meet with us by your spirit that we may uh, understand more and more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> well, as I said, we do uh, very much miss all of you. Um, we look forward, if the Lord is pleased to bring us back soon, that we would indeed be back soon. Uh, it's we uh, are all the more eager, having heard of some new uh, folk that have been attending. Uh, we look forward to uh, having having all of you over for meals and, uh, and getting properly caught up and enjoying one another's fellowship and most of all, enjoying uh, worshiping uh, and coming together uh, in prayer at the prayer meetings uh, with the brethren of the English Reformed Church. Well, this has indeed uh, been a difficult and a sad time for the church. I think the most uh, difficult thing, or I trust it is, is that God has taken away the corporate means of grace. Uh, I see this as his judgment upon the church, um, that he takes it away, and, uh, and it's been all the more sad. As we've seen here, I... I, I hope it's not so much in South Africa, but I see people that are actually have become quite comfortable with not being able to uh, 
joining together with the Lord's people to worship. They've settled into being able to watch the worship services on their couch, and, uh, and the Lord's Day is, is much less complicated for them. And it's also been a difficult and a sad time as we've seen how the church has been viewed by, uh, by society and, and by the government. I, um, I, I have uh, spoken to some of you and to the students, of course, and I get a little bit of a sense. Here in, in the United States, the church has very much been lumped in when they're coming up with all of these guidelines and the rules in dealing with COVID-19. You have your essential businesses, non-essential, and, uh, and a few things in between. And the truth is that the church has very much been getting lumped in with restaurants, nightclubs, and theaters, which, of course, means that uh, in our day, uh, at least here in the United States very much, that worship has been seen on the same level of importance as entertainment. And it's also been discouraging to see a lot of the interviews with pastors and all how we're thankful for those who have been faithful in dealing with people's souls as we've been having these problems. But most of the interviews that we see with pastors, uh, they're speaking not in terms of God having the authority to call us to worship him, not as our need uh, to glorify God, and not speaking in terms of the, we calling the, the nation, the people, the church especially, to repentance, but rather speaking in terms of our rights and, uh, and here in the United States about the First Amendment and those sorts of things. And, and perhaps, uh, and, and just as sad, in many cases you see pastors this was a name I hadn't heard in quite some time, but uh, Rodney Howard Brown, apparently he's in Florida now, and he was in the news, and they identify him as an evangelical pastor, and he has refused to, uh, to follow any of the guidelines, and he instructs all of his people to kiss one another and to shake hands, and, uh, and the name of Christ um, is dragged through the mud. And it's great uh, that in South Africa the worship will be um, the, sorry that, uh, that that you will be able to worship again. But again, uh, the emphasis uh, is very much it sounds like on mental health and sense of the community. Uh, there is much to mourn in our day in the condition of the church. Um, you compare it to uh, what we heard about in Patrick's series on Acts, uh, the Lord's people uh, loving each other in such a remarkable way, um, though there was much sin in it as well, uh, how they sought the Lord together, and uh, most of all, the incredible work that the Lord was pleased um, to do through them in their day. And as you go through church history and you consider revivals, and, uh, and the influence uh, that the gospel had on entire countries. Entire countries were turned around, um, and so many uh, were brought into the church, having been truly converted, and even unbelievers were ashamed of their sin. And there were many who hated the Lord and the people of God, but they never just let them in with restaurants. Uh, the people of God in the time of Acts and in so many times in church history made a stir everywhere they went. And many were convicted and many were, um, and many hated them. Uh, but they were not despised, I don't think, in, in much of the way that uh, so much of it is happening today. Uh, but at the same time, and uh, this is what we're going to focus on this morning, uh, there are some wonderful encouragements, even in a time uh, of the Lord's discipline, I believe, upon the church. And we see uh, many people, and I, I wonder if the Lord will be pleased to use this time 
to, uh, to call uh, maybe many that we never would have expected into his kingdom. Uh, several that wouldn't normally join a worship service. I hear out now that all of the worship services are being streamed over video. Uh, many are watching these services and hearing uh, truly biblical preaching. And there are several encouraging stories that we've heard of. People who've seen this opportunity and sought to honor the Lord in it. And I trust that we all are. Uh, I was especially encouraged when Katie told me that she had read her story from Rosaria Buckfield. Uh, I believe it was on her blog. And, uh, and Rosaria Butterfield uh, realized that, okay, you know, nobody can, everybody's uh, uh, shelter in place, they call it. Everybody's staying at home. And so what did Rosaria Butterfield do? She and I believe her, her husband, who was, a, who was a pastor here, and, and their teenage children all signed up to do food deliveries. And so they were, uh, and so they were some of the only people that could actually interact with everybody. And they were going from house to house, uh, delivering food from the grocery store to these people who were terrified to even step outside their doors. And they had wonderful opportunities to uh, speak to these folks about the things of the Lord. And it's encouraging to see, therefore as we've just read in Matthew chapter 16, that our, Lord, um, that our Lord is building his church. Well, in the context of this passage, our, our blessed Lord asks uh, this, this wonderful question that gives the, the disciples the opportunity to honor him with their answer. And uh, Peter, of course, is the one who answers uh, how often am I reminded as I look, at, as I read about Peter and the scriptures that our greatest, our greatest strength uh, is also so often our greatest weakness. So you have Peter who is so bold and makes this wonderful proclamation here, uh, replying and saying that, uh, that you are the Son of God, um, or that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then in the very next passage, uh, he has the nerve to rebuke uh, the Lord of heaven and earth. Well, Peter answers, and, and then our Lord says to him, and I tell you, um, Peter, that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. There's been uh, much discussion uh, over the centuries about what this means. The Roman Catholics want to say that that Peter is uh, is the first pope here, but of course, uh, what it must mean, and I think it probably is uh, saying that it's on uh, on Peter. Sorry, just sit back. Run around. Okay. Sorry about that, brother. <clears throat> <clears throat> but I think that what this means here is the same as what we read in Ephesians 20 where we read that um, the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets so of course they're not, uh, they're not the primary foundation there's no other foundation but Christ but of course this is uh, pointing to the, uh, the, the apostles who were called um, to provide the teaching that points people to the ultimate foundation, uh, which is Christ. And of course, we read, therefore, in 1 Corinthians 3, that there is no other foundation besides Christ. And also, uh, and then he speaks about the keys of the kingdom, which we won't get into, but uh, these keys of the kingdom are speaking about uh, the responsibility and Christ's administration of the church uh, through the leaders that he has called um, in church discipline. But uh, our focus here is that our blessed Lord and Savior will build his church. Christ will build his church. Uh, this is, uh, there will be two points. Uh, Christ will build his church. 
Christ will build his church is the first point, and the second point is the gates of Hades will not overcome it. <clears throat> Christ will build his church. Uh, how wonderful it should be uh, to hear those words, that Christ will build his church, that it is indeed the triune God who takes the initiative. Uh, let us uh, turn to Ephesians chapter 1. I'll begin reading in verse 13. Oh, pardon me, I'll begin reading in verse 3. Um, Ephesians chapter 1. Uh, we'll see uh, the initiative is taken, of course, um, by the triune God. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him, that is Christ, before the creation of the world, to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. And he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ, to be put into effect when the times will, will have reached their fulfillment, to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Brethren, how wonderful is this to consider that the triune God is engaged in saving his people and building in building our blessed Lord's church. Um, of course, we can speak in terms of the triune God being engaged in calling people in Christ uh, that they might be saved because the Father of course, does everything through the Son and by the Spirit. Uh, the it is to consider that it depends ultimately upon God's sovereign grace to us. And what a warning we should take here, and how easy it is, as Jim prayed earlier to uh, be building our own kingdoms and to imagine that these things ultimately are done in our own strength. And what a shameful thing it is to take pride in the building of God's kingdom that he's been pleased to use us in as his instruments uh, when we know, of course, that God is glorified because he uses the weak things of this world, uh, to confound those things that are great. We're built upon Christ. Uh, Isaiah 
28, verse 16. So this is what the Sovereign Lord says. See, I lay a stone in Zion, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone for a sure foundation. The one who trusts will never be dismayed. Our blessed Savior who is our prophet, our priest, and our king. Uh, we are saved in every way in our blessed Lord. We need someone to give us wisdom. Do we need understanding? Do we need truth? Well, our blessed Savior is in the Can you not hear me? Sorry, I'm not understanding anything. Okay. Uh, if you can't hear me, then perhaps someone can, could, uh, could run. Sorry, Goth. Just continue, dear brother. Um, <clears throat> there was just someone who forgot to mute their microphone. Oh, okay. Thank you. So he is our prophet. He is our priest. Uh, so are we sinners? Do we need someone to intercede for us? To the Father, do we need someone uh, to uh, to deliver us from the guilt of sin, uh, from the filth of it? Uh, do we need someone that we can come to uh, with no righteousness of our own? Uh, our blessed Savior is engaged to be our priest, uh, and He is our King. Do we uh, need someone? Uh, do we need him to subdue us to himself? Do we need him to protect us? Uh, let us come to our blessed Savior who has engaged himself to be our king um, and provide for us all that we need. And second point, uh, that the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Brethren, we are in a most fearful spiritual battle. Uh, how quick we can be to forget that the strength and the power and everything uh, must come from Christ who built his church. And also, how quick can we be to forget what we read in Ephesians 6, that our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Satan and his demons uh, seeking to destroy us. Mm -hmm. uh, brethren, this is a battle that I think we very much underestimate. I certainly know that I do on a daily basis, and uh, I say that to my shame. But this is a horrifying battle that we're in. But our Lord is engaged in building his church, our Blessed Lord and Savior is, is working in us that we might work out our salvation with fear and trembling. And his provision cannot be overcome. How wonderful it is to know that our Lord is interceding for us, that he is working in us, and that he is sovereign over all things for his glory and for the good of his people, and that even when we receive the most terrible trials, uh, terrible I say as far as uh, the suffering that we can endure, um, that these are from his loving hand, and that he is using them to build his church. Uh, I appreciated those Oswald studies on Isaiah. I must confess that I've forgotten much of what Oswald covered in those studies, although I still uh, do have some precious memories of that content. But the thing that stuck with me, I think, the most as he was going through the chapters of Isaiah is he was talking about how God uses 
his judgments and the trials that he sends and the discipline. And how you can have the same tragedy from God's hand, which is a punishment for his enemies. And that very same punishment, that very same calamity, uh, God has sent that he might purify his people. Uh, how wonderful it is that our Lord does not leave us to ourselves and how, how our hearts are laid bare as we go through uh, various trials. And I think of this COVID-19 that uh, I know it's spoken about so much, but it's really shocking how quickly everything can change over just a week. And here in the United States, they had, I, you know, I don't know who to trust, but uh, the people were speaking in terms of the best economy ever. Well, I, I don't know about that, but it was a very uh, strong economy. And, and now we have, uh, we have depression level unemployment. And so many people who were trusting in their bank accounts uh, now see uh, their net worth uh, at just a fraction of what it was before and uh, how many of the Lord's people who were not aware of how afraid they were to die or perhaps how unprepared um, I've come to see this um, through this uh, through this pandemic that the Lord is using to build his church and how many of us have had our pride exposed our pride, not just in our accomplishments and what we can do and imagining that we're in control, but likewise, our pride in not being able to cheerfully submit towards providence. Mm. Have the rulers always made the right decisions? Of course not. But these things come to us from the Lord's hand. And if I'm not able to cheerfully submit to what I see as someone taking away more of my rights than they should, or if I'm not able to uh, cheerfully accept that uh, there are people out there who are not being as careful as they should. And, of course, we can be indignant about these things. Sam, stop it. Um, but, um, but how our hearts are, are laid bare um, in these things, and we're brought to see our, our sin and our weakness and our absolute dependence upon the grace that we find uh, in Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. And brethren, uh, again, one of the most uh, troubling uh, sins that's revealed in our hearts is how many of us have found out during this pandemic that we prefer to stay home instead of going to church. Uh, well, brethren, uh, the, the seeds of all of these sins are in us, um, and as the Lord exposes them uh, and shows us our sin and our selfishness and our self-indulgence, then what does he call us to? He, he sends these things that we might see our sin, that we might mourn over it, and that we might turn afresh to our blessed Savior uh, for forgiveness and for strength that we might turn from our sin and honor him. So how wonderful it is to know that the gates of Hades will not overcome. The gospel it continues to be preached and people are converted. This war, this spiritual war between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent continues. Uh, but as we read in John chapter 10, his sheep hear his voice, and none shall pluck them out of his hand. And he continues to reveal our sin to us. He continues to lead us on. He continues to give us victory over the enemy. And though this is perhaps a day of small things, our Lord has his people, um, and he continues to prepare them for the glory to come.
So what is our application here? Well, the first application I would draw is that we should consider how we should respond to the Lord's providence. Uh, as we consider these things, we don't just see it. Uh, I try these things that are happening to us, but as a call for us to search our hearts and uh, to consider uh, whether uh, this is uh, a discipline against us for particular but always uh, to see this as coming to us from the Lord's hand. And uh, perhaps it's not for a particular sin that, we, uh, that God is calling us to repent of, um, but then we see it again as a chance uh, to be trained in righteousness and a chance to see more and more our need of Christ Jesus um, and the call to turn to him with all of our hearts. And this also should be a wonderful encouragement to us in the work of the kingdom. That it's, uh, it's by his spirit that he accomplishes these things in the book of Acts, in the great revivals, and in our day. Um, Christ is the head of his church for his glory and for the good of the body. And, and he will us in the work of the kingdom. Uh, let us come to him over and over, uh, call for him to intercede for us to the Father and see what terrible folly and wickedness it is uh, to be ashamed of our Savior. Um, brethren, let us see the work that Christ is doing in building his church uh, let us be encouraged and let us see it as the most wonderful, wonderful privilege and pleasure to be engaged in this work um, as our Savior's body, with him as our head. Let us pray. For our gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for your goodness and your love to us. Um, Thank you for your patience with us and, uh, and for, the full, for the salvation that is ours in Christ um, and the enabling of your spirit. Father, please uh, help us to see the things that are happening and indeed all things uh, with the eyes of faith um, to not just be focused on the things that are happening. Um, but to see that, uh, that you are in the control of all things and that you are always providing for your people and building your church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.